Okay, we are uh, in the book of the First Thessalonians, okay? Written by the Apostle Paul in chapter 4. And we'll read about uh, 10 or 12 verses in that, and uh, we'll look at some things that he's talking about. And I think things that will be beneficial. Appreciate your presence this morning. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> Beginning in the uh, fourth chapter, he says, Finally, then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what uh, commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of, the, of and defraud his brother in this manner. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, and as, as we also forewarn you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who also has given us his Holy Spirit. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I write unto you, for you, uh, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, and indeed you do so toward the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, uh, that you increase more and more, and that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, do your work, uh, and your own work with your own hands as we command you, that you may also, or that you may walk uh, properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. And I want to stop right there. Okay. So in this, in this particular setting, he's talking about the commandments that he had given them and how that they ought to walk and to please the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, uh, that word walk is used, I don't know how many hundreds and hundreds of times throughout the Bible. You know, it talks about uh, on one occasion, you know, it says Moses, uh, Noah walked with God. Enoch walked with God before that. Elijah was taken to heaven. He walked with God. All of the old worthies of the Old Testament, both men and women, walked with God. Simply means they obeyed God. They kept the commandments of God and they had a relationship with Almighty God. And he blessed them abundantly because they kept the covenant that they had uh, been assigned to under the Old Testament. Well, it's true today, and he's talking about us walking with God and walk the walk that we should walk as Christians today. We ought to walk uh, in favor with God by keeping his commandments and doing those things that he calls us to do. And we can do that just like they did. And we could be as honored as Noah was, as Abraham, you know, uh, Isaac and Jacob and others by keeping the commandments of God and walking with him. God, play, God has, shows no respect of person. He has, shows no partiality. If a man today under the Christian covenant walks with God in obedience to his will, can be just as honored and just as favored as any one of the Old Testament. But God is showing in the Old Testament how he did honor uh, and bless certain individuals who really stood out and walked with him. And obeyed him, keeping the commandments. And he honors them. And I think that's just an example for us that if we do the same thing, God's honoring us. And we have favor with God. But he tells the Thessalonians here, now he says, you know, you do this, but I want you to abound more and more in your walk with God. Abound more and more and love your brethren more and more in the Lord. So uh, he's just encouraging them to keep on keeping on and obey the commandments of God as he had given them to him. Okay. Uh, and he talks about sin here and sexual immorality and those kinds of things. And, uh, and he deals with that. But what I really want to deal with more than anything this morning is the idea that he says uh, in verse 3. He says... Uh, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from this sin and all other sins, of course, that are involved in the sinful nature of the flesh. 
So anyway, he's talking about being sanctified. And we talk about that sometimes because we know that sanctification actually means to be set apart. <coughs> set apart from the world, set apart from sin, and uh, set not only apart, but set unto God. So God separates from the world of sin, and he separates us from the works of the flesh, and he puts us in a place where we have fellowship with him, and we walk in righteousness and true holiness with God. Cleansing us every day through the blood of Jesus Christ. So we remain sanctified in this relationship that we have with God through the person of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who made that sacrifice for us. And it's really something to understand, but what I also want to deal with in that concept is the fact that there are two parts, if you will, to our sanctification. There's the part that God does, and then there's a part that he calls us to do. Otherwise, we share in that uh, uh, sanctification, okay? God sets us apart, and we need to stay there. <laughs> you know, God separates us from sin through the blood of Christ, and we need to try to live sinlessly, okay, as we possibly can. So here we are uh, as children of God, sanctified, set apart. Uh, we're trying to live for the Lord like he calls us to live for him. And he's working with us and in us, sanctifying us, blessing us with the forgiveness of sin and with the relationship that he wants to have with us. They had a relationship under the old covenant. We have one under the new covenant. The one under the new covenant is far better in every way based on better promises than the old covenant ever was. Okay, It was just a shadow of that which is to come. Now, the covenant that we live under is a blessed covenant. We know that. And God forgives us of our sins and remembers them no longer. Okay? That's the wonderful thing about this new covenant. And he can do that if we keep our part of that covenant. A covenant is simply, if you want to look at it from a simple point of view, it's just a, an agreement. God says, this is what I will do for you if you will do these things for me. If you will keep my commandments... I will do these things for you. And it's, it's a pretty simple kind of deal. And we read the Bible, and he's given us this word in order to instruct us on how to live for him. And if we do that, he will keep all of his promises. And we'll look more at that as we go along. But we just need to understand that, that God has called us well, he has called us, uh, if you will, in uh, Ephesians 4, verse 1. Uh, Paul said, I, uh, the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, uh, I called you to walk according to the vocation wherewith you were called. According to the vocation wherewith you were called. And sometimes you read that and you say, according to the vacation, you know, that we've been called. No, it's not a vacation. It's a, it's a vocation, okay? Now, when you think about vocation, we talk about, you know, uh, some kind of special training that people go through. We have vocational schools, right? Sometimes we send our children to those in order to get some special training, to train them in some kind of craft or, 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 or career or whatever it might be, okay? So it's a, it's a training school. A vocation is a training school. And when we, think about, when we think about sanctification and the church and the teaching and the worship and all that that is involved with God, it is a training school, okay? That's what the church is. It's a teaching institution. And we come to services to learn. We come to services to learn about God and how to serve God and how to be sanctified by following Jesus Christ, okay? So we need to understand that how important that is for uh, us as individuals, okay? I don't know about you. I need that training. I always need that training. Even though I know that training, I still need that training. That's what Peter said on his occasion, right? He said, I know you already know it, but I'm writing again just to stir up your pure minds, you know, that you might not forget. And that's what he deals with. And he says that about three or four times in Second Peter and First Peter. You know, I'm, I'm just reminding you, you know. Well, we all need to be reminded. Now, attending worship services and, and, and coming together for Bible classes and those kinds of things, and those kinds of things, we need to uh, understand that it just helps us to remember, okay, our sanctification, to remember our relationship with Jesus Christ. And that is very, uh, very vital and very important because 
uh, uh, like I say, again, a vocation is a way of training for a career or some special skills or something of that nature. That's what Christianity is, brothers and sisters. And when God saved us through the blood of Christ, he added us to his church. Did he not? Acts 2, verse 30, uh, 47, right? So we're added to the church and we all come together. We learn from each other. We encourage each other. We have fellowship with each other. We love each other, and we help each other in uh, living for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. We're a big family, sanctified by the blood of Jesus, and it's a sanctification. It's really a great thing. You know, Amos said on one occasion, Amos 3, verse 3, he said, How can two walk together except they be agreed? It's true, is it not? You know, my wife walks about two miles an hour, and I walk about five, and it's not very long, and we're separated. You know, I'm way on out there, and she's way back there. We are not walking together anymore when we go for a walk. I can't walk that slow. That's just, that's just absolutely too slow for me. I get tired trying to walk slow. I can, I, I can do better walking fast, you know, because that's me. Well, you know, only this is a spiritual thing, is it not? We're talking spiritual, but just to make the example, how can two walk together except they be agreed? We can't walk with God unless we agree with God. Okay, we have to agree with God's commandments and teaching. I think you're going to get some of that this morning uh, uh, from the uh, sermon. But the idea is uh, we agree with God, then we can walk with God. God calls me to do this. He, he calls me to develop myself and to use my talent and, uh, in the kingdom of God to do what I can to further uh, the, uh, you know, my own spirituality, help others grow in spirituality, and, and help us to be more and more like Jesus Christ. So that's what we do. That's what we do. And so I'm, I'm under the responsibility to work in sanctifying of myself or doing my part of the sanctification process. And God will do his part. You know, so, and we have this, and in doing so, we just have this beautiful relationship with God. It's not that we're ever going to make perfection. You know, we're never going to be there. But we can strive to serve God in a, in a better way and to do more uh, in that relationship to maintain that relationship with God and to live that sanctified life. And, uh, you know, Paul said on one occasion in Galatians, the sixth chapter, he said, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall reap everlasting life. So he's just simply saying there's two ways to go in life. You know, we can walk with God. We can walk with God spiritually and serve God and have eternal life. Or we can just sow to the flesh whatever satisfies the flesh. Isn't that what he was talking about here? That we should uh, abstain from uh, 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 sexual immorality and other sins. You know, that these are the things that are going to separate us from God. But we can walk with God we can walk with God by not walking according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, you know, and I know, I live in the flesh, you know, and, and Brother Larry and I, and my, uh, Mike was down yesterday, and we spent a little time, and, and, uh, and somebody said something about food. And he said, you guys want to go eat? He said, I'll buy. I said, yeah, we'll go. <laughs> so... So he took us out here uh, on the other side of uh, uh, go over here to that uh, barbecue place. Uh, uh, yeah. So we went out there and we had, uh, you know, barbecued uh, uh, lunch. It was about 2 o'clock more, more between dinner and lunch, okay? And, you know, so we went out there and we ate and really enjoyed I mean, you have to take care of the physical body, okay? That's all right. God understands that. But there are two ways to live in this physical body. You know, we can live righteously in this spiritual or in this physical body by following God and, 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 uh, and walking with God. Or we can, in this physical body, we can just flat live sinfully if we want to and do whatever we want to do. He won't stop you, but you will lose your relationship and your sanctification with God if you so live that way, okay? So he's saying, he's warning us about that. And he says, so if you live according to the flesh, of the flesh you'll reap corruption. He doesn't mean that it's not to take care of yourselves and your family and provide and all that kind of things, you know, and have a career and all of the things that you need to do in this life. But in the same token, we need to be living for God. 
we need to be serving the Lord and keep our relationship with him so we can be sanctified. Uh, look at, uh, if you would, turn to uh, first Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. Uh, I want to read a few verses right here in that sixth, uh, sixth chapter. I, I think it's so, so important, something we need to really understand about our relationship with God. And uh, in the beginning of verse 14 of that sixth chapter, 2 Corinthians, he says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what accord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, he says, come out from among them, be separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So God is simply saying, those that I have sanctified, I have set apart. They belong to me. Okay? And he says, have no fellowship with those things that would destroy that relationship that we have with God. Though we are in the flesh, not of the flesh. But we live here in this world. And we live here with expectation of eternal life and the blessing uh, of God every day of our lives, okay? You know, and not only that, I want to look at Ephesians chapter 2. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, what the apostle will say there about our relationship uh, uh, with God. Uh, in the second chapter of the Ephesian letter, uh, Paul deals with some of this. It talks, about, it talks about Jews and Gentiles. Understand that the Jews had this, through Moses' law, they had a relationship with God, okay? He sanctified uh, that, uh, that nation of people. Uh, the 12 tribes of Israel were sanctified unto God, okay? Now, he didn't sanctify the Gentiles, but that, that law and that covenant was given uh, to the Jews, okay? And they were a sanctified people unto God. He said a royal priesthood, a holy nation. He honored them, and he set them aside to be his people. And he blessed them, and he blessed them until they get sinful, you know, so sinful he had to draw back from them because they become like those people among whom they lived. So uh, as time went by, you know, there was a lot of ups and downs concerning them. But Paul talks about it in the second chapter of Ephesians, about, beginning at about verse uh, 11. He says, Therefore remember that ye uh, once Gentiles in the flesh who are called circum uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in uh, the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Now this was the Gentile nations that surrounded Israel, okay, and surrounded the, the people of God. They just all over. They didn't run them all out like they were supposed to and destroy the seven nations. And now the seven nations are taking advantage of them. But nevertheless, God never, uh, never uh, intended to uh, totally destroy uh, uh, the Gentile nations, okay? God intended uh, for the na Gentile nations to be saved. It's, it, you know, it's coming. It's coming when Christ comes, okay? That blessed deal is coming. So notice what he goes on to say. He says, uh, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought nigh by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace." and that he might reconcile both in, in God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who are afar off and those who were near. And through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. And so he goes on talking about then Jews and Gentiles, okay? The Jews were called to his people, the Gentiles were not. They were not part of the covenants. They were not part of the blessings of God. They had no hope, and they were without God. 
but God never intended that to always be, okay? Like I said, the old law was just a shadow of that which is to come. When he made a promise to Abraham in, Gen in Genesis chapter 12, uh, he said, of your, of your seed shall all the nations of the world be blessed. In Galatians 3, Paul said, that seed, not many seeds, that one seed is Christ. And so therefore, both Jew and Gentile are reconciled together in one body by the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So no matter who we are, where we come from, doesn't matter. We can have this same relationship with God that everyone from the very beginning of the new covenant had, okay? We can be God's children today just as they were then. So he goes on to say, notice what he says now. We're still in chapter 2, okay? Then he says, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building fitted together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Ah, awesome. Awesome. When we become that family of God and He sanctifies us, He adds us to the church, then we are the family of the living God and the Spirit of God dwells in His church. Okay. And he will continue to dwell in the church as long as the church continues to observe his will, worship him and serve him and do the things that he has called us to do. You know, I, I want to, in John 17, 17, he says, he said, uh, Jesus in his prayer, he said, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know, the word of God is truth and it's the word of God that sanctifies us. How does it do that? How does his word sanctify us? What would you say just in a sentence? Like guiding us. Huh? Guiding us. It guides us. Sets us apart from that which is sinful and wrong and evil. And it sets forth that which is good, right? It sanctifies. It says if you'll do this, not do that, you'll be sanctified. And you and you you continue in that work. I'll continue to sanctify you and bless you and forgive you and prepare you for eternal life. And so that's what we we need to consider uh, when we think about sanctification. You know, it's a it's it's an ongoing thing. I mean, there's a sense in which you're sanctified when you when you go down in that watery grave and you bury that old man, and you come up out of that watery grave, and you're a new person in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 6, 17. Isn't it? So when you come up out of there, you're a new person, and you're starting a new life all over again. No matter what you've done prior to that, it's erased, okay? God just erases it off the board. You're starting all over again. You're his, his child, male or female, and now you're a new person. And he adds you to the church so you can grow and so you can have fellowship with those who believe in Jesus and, and all of those who are trying and striving to walk according to the will of God. And so that's what it's all about. You know, and I, I, I'm amazed. I really am. I'm amazed on how many don't think the church is important today. Like, ah, you don't have to go to church to be saved. That's nonsense. Well, how can you say that? How can you even think that? That's a part of our sanctification. That's the real nitty-gritty when you get right down to it. That's where the, you know, the rubber meets the blacktop, so to speak. That's where it's all at right there, that fellowship that we have, that teaching that we have. Also in the fourth chapter of the Ephesian letter, notice what Paul says here. Uh, over here in chapter 4, let me get over here. He says, beginning in about verse uh, 10, he says, uh, He uh, who descended is also the one who ascended far above all, uh, all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, and even uh, uh, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Hear him now. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ 
till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man and to the measure and stature and the fullness of Christ. Think about that. Where are they going to do that? Well, the, the, the apostles and prophets and, and, and pastors and teachers and evangelists are going to do that. We don't have apostles with us today. We don't have inspired uh, prophets, and we, and we don't have the inspired apostles, but we got what they taught to the church in their day, and when we follow this instruction and teaching by, by the teachers and the, uh, elders and, and, and preachers in the church today, we get the same teaching they gave them. So we can be sanctified. So we can come to the knowledge of the truth. Notice what he says there again. I, I really like that. Equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. Oh, yeah. That's right. There's a work to do, right? We have a work to do for the edifying of the body of Christ. He says, till we all come, not some of us, but till we all come to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man or mature man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Otherwise, so we can walk in the steps of Jesus with knowledge and wisdom and understanding, applying ourselves to live that Christian life. And how do we do that? Like, as I said before, the church is a teaching institution. We're here to learn the vocation, that spiritual vocation of walking in the steps of Jesus. And that's what we're here to do. And it's so sad that when brethren can be here for Bible classes and for worship and here from Sunday and here on Sunday night for worship and all that and just, I know some miss cause illness and everything else. I understand that. But I'm, I'm talking about just willfully saying, I don't go. Some say, I don't. <laughs> been, Steve mentioned this uh, Wednesday night. Oh, I don't want to go up there on Wednesday night. All I'm doing is watching a video. But well, that's not true. We're doing a lot more than that. For one thing, we're having fellowship with each other, the ones that are here. And not only that, we sing some songs, we have prayer, we talk about the sick, and we, and we discuss the video that we see. We talk about that. What did this man teach? What do we get from what he taught? You know, we do that on Sunday night, and we do it on Wednesday night now. That'll all change one of these days, I'm sure. But nevertheless, right now, that's what we're doing. And I don't understand why we can just say, ah, it's just a video. I can, see, I can see a video at home. No, you can't. You can't see a video at home without just being here with the brethren and the fellowship. And we need to think of that more importantly. We really do. We need to understand that all that's significant. Not only that, the elders uh, of this congregation ask the congregation to be here. The Bible teaches that to disobey your elders is a bad thing. And we're not going to ask you to do anything that God will not ask you to do. So, therefore, in 1 Corinthians, look at 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. that but I ready to read it with me. First Corinthians six chapter beginning in verse nineteen he says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, whom you have from God, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Also, many in your body and in your spirit is bought with a price, the price of the blood of Christ, and that the Spirit of God dwells in us. And so this sanctification is so important. And when you stop to realize that the Spirit of God dwells in you, isn't that an incentive to want to be better? <laughs> you, know, you know, God lives in me through the Spirit. I don't want to do this sin over here that my buddy wants me to go do or something like that. No, I don't want to do that. Because God is with me. He sees it. He knows it. Uh, you know, isn't it more important that we realize that I'd rather remain sanctified 
with God and be in favor with God than in favor with my buddy or my friend over here that wants me to do something contrary to the will of God. And I know we're human beings and we're weak. And I know we uh, do a lot of living in the flesh, do we not? <laughs> we just need to learn to control it the best that we can and try to live according to God's will because God is in you. And uh, we, we need to do all that we can. So let me, let me illustrate all this here. I want to illustrate this by talking about the tabernacle in the wilderness. You remember when Moses built the tabernacle in the wilderness and this is where God would meet with the high priest once a year and he would go into the Holy of Holies. It was a two compartment. He would go into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the animals and he would first of all atone for himself and then he would atone for the children of Israel that God may forgive them of their sins, okay? So this was done once a year, but the priest, his four sons were the priests, and uh, they had various ministries that they had to do within there, okay? So this temple was, uh, our tabernacle was built, and it was built to precise detail, okay? God designed it. God gave the blueprint for it, and he told Moses, see that you build it according uh, to the, you know, to the uh, pattern that I gave you in the mountain." You build it just like that because that's where God was going to meet with his people. That's where he was going to give instruction to Moses and the priests and all of that. That's where God would meet uh, uh, in, in that various place, okay? And it was a form of sanctifying. God's people were sanctified by him and he was there in their presence, okay? Uh, and, and that's where they would meet with him. But... Of course, when they would sin and get so bad, then he wouldn't show up there, okay? He wouldn't have anything to do with it. But the idea is, the idea is that tabernacle represents the church today, okay? It represents the church today. How it was built it was a shadow of the church to come. When God saves his people, he adds them together and puts them in the church. He sanctifies us. And we're in the church. And we do what God wants us to do according to his word and not what we want to do. Okay? We live by his word. We obey him. And as long as we obey him and love him and serve him, he sanctifies us. He blesses us in this life. He protects us. He does so many things for us that you could not even imagine nor calculate. <laughs> you know, if you had a piece of paper that would run from here to the back of the building, you could not write it all down what God does for us day by day. And uh, I, I'm just saying that he, he does so much for us, and so it seems that we do so little for him. But the tabernacle really represents uh, uh, what God does with his people when he saves them. Uh, and so this went on. And, you know, he built this tabernacle and all of the furniture of the tabernacle in a certain way. Okay, all oh, awesome furniture, man, overlaid with gold and all of that kind of stuff. But it was made to take down piece by piece. Put it all together, take it down piece by piece. The tribe of Levi was to carry all of that tabernacle and all of the furniture to the next place where God would say, we're going to be here for a while, put up the tabernacle. Okay? No one else could touch it. Only one tribe, the tribe of Levi. That's the one that God sanctified to move his tabernacle. Anybody else touches that, they're going to die. Remember the story of 1 Corinthians 14 to 15? David, the great king, man after God's own heart. Okay? Man after God's own heart. He was going to go down and get this, uh, the uh, Ark of the Covenant, and he was going to move it up to Jerusalem, okay? And put it there where he lives, his eye on. Because he built a tabernacle there for it. And they go down to get it. And they load uh, uh, the uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant on this trailer. Okay, or wagon. No, I say trailer, but it was a wagon. And it pulled by an oxen. Oxen, okay. So they were going along there, and, and the oxen stumbled, and the trailer, you know, tilted like that, and the Ark of the Covenant was going to fall out. And that was Uzzah. Man, he put his hands up there to stop that from coming, and God struck him dead. Boom. <laughs> he wasn't a Levi. He wasn't allowed to touch that. I, I know his heart was right. He just tried to spare that, you know, 
And his heart was right. And what they were doing was right. I mean, in the heart. They believed they were doing the right thing. They had the right heart to move that to Jerusalem and all that. That was wonderful. They wanted that right there in God's city, okay? And they wanted to do that. Their heart was right in doing that. But the way they did it, their method was wrong. Their method was wrong. And then in the 15th chapter, you can read right where David got to thinking about that. And they left this uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant at the home of uh, Edom Odom, okay? Uh, and they left it there for three months. And they finally figured out, and David said, I know what we did wrong. I know what we did wrong. We didn't do it after the due order because the due order was for the Levites to bear the Ark of the Covenant with the two poles that, that runs through there. They put it up on their shoulders and they were to carry it. Not put it on a cart and not pull it with a cart. They had to carry that wherever they went. So David said, I'll tell you what happened. Here's what happened. We didn't do it after the due order of the way that Moses commanded it to be done. And so it cost the life of a man who just tried to honestly tried to spare it, you know, tried to save it from breaking up or whatever. But when God gives a commandment, that's the way it is. Do it the way he says do it. And that's what we try to do in the church, is not? We just try to do it the way God says do it, you know. Sing songs. We can do it without a mechanical instrument, but some can. They won't do it without one. Why? I don't know. God never asked for it. You know, we take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. Why? Because the early church did that. Upon the first day of the week, they came together to sanctify, you know, what Christ has done for them, to acknowledge that, to praise God in that. But a lot of folks don't do that. Why? You know? But nevertheless, we need to understand we do things God's way and it's not always uh, so impressive and it's not always so exciting for people, but it's doing it right. That's what counts, doing it after the right order. I bring your attention to another situation. Uh, Aaron, the high priest, had four sons and uh, these four sons had duties to perform there within the tabernacle, okay? And Nadab and Abihu, okay, Abihu were his sons. And their duty was to burn incense, you know, that beautiful aroma that comes up before God. In Revelation letter, it talks about the aroma of our prayers, you know. But they were to burn this uh, incense and this aroma, you know, please, and to burn it, you know. And they were to take fire off of the altar outside, the uh, uh, altar of sacrifice, and, and burn that incense. And they got some fire from somewhere else. It says strange fire. They offered some strange fire up to the Lord. And uh, so he just uh, set them on fire right there in the tabernacle. Burn them right there. Destroyed their lives right there. Sons of Aaron, the high priest. Okay. He had two other sons, Ithamar and Eliezer. But... Uh, God burned him up right there. Moses came in there and he said, don't you do nothing. <laughs> don't you weep. You know, don't tear your clothes. Don't you, don't you show no sign of anything. Neither you nor your sons. Israel will carry those bodies out and they will, uh, you know, lament for your sons out there. But you do not, not do that. And this is what Moses said. He said, God will be sanctified. And they didn't sanctify him in their acts of worship. He says, God will be sanctified, okay? So what we need to understand, there is a way to worship God in, in sanctification and honor and, and, and glory and, and praise His wonderful name and make Him feel great and wonderful as well as edifying us and building us up in the faith and strengthening us because we're honoring God the way He wants us to. And we know that. Why we know that? Because it's right here. But it, it, I, I thought that was, uh, you know, that's quite an example uh, of what God will do uh, uh, when he tries to, you know, the, he, he, there are many examples in the Old Testament where God did things of that kind of nature uh, in order to show I am God, I am the Lord, there is none other, and it will be as I say it will be, and that's the way it's going to be, you know. And the sooner we learn that, you know, as, as people and as believers, the sooner we learn to do things the way God wants us to do things, the more blessing we're going to receive from God. Is it not true? Sure is. Sure is. And uh, so 
But those examples are, are just examples of where uh, they didn't sanctify God as they were supposed to. And it resulted in God making a breach and, and uh, coming in on them and making them realize that. But can you imagine that? Here, here's the high priest, Aaron. There's his two sons. I mean, crispy critters. You know, <laughs> that's kind of a rude way of saying it, but you know, he, he destroyed them with fire right there in, in the tabernacle, and those men had to stand there and uh, show no emotion. Show no emotion. They couldn't weep for him or anything, even though they wanted to. Show no emotion because they represented God in that tabernacle high priest and they represent the fact that these two men my sons died because they didn't sanctify God and say they, they couldn't even they couldn't even weep or cry or show motion wow let me ask you this is God different today than he was then same God huh but I want to share this thought with you, and I, I, I've always believed. They were sanctified through the offering of the blood of animals. We are sanctified and saved from our sin by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about how that Jesus uh, took away the wrath of God by the giving of his life and shedding his blood. I believe we're in a far better relationship with God today with far more mercy and grace and forgiveness than they ever experienced under the Old Testament. Not because we're so much better, but because the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Wow. Thank God. Let's have a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the day. Thank you for the blessings, Father, that you've given us day by day. We just pray, Father, for strength and faith uh, uh, that we'll uh, grow, Father, in knowledge and understanding of your will. Help us to be more faithful. Help us to walk more in the steps of our Lord, Father, to walk in the light as he is in the light. Bless us, Father, and strengthen us as a congregation of people. Help us to love one another and help us, Father, to live sanctified lives in your sight. And help us as a congregation, as a family, to be sanctified, Father, in supporting and encouraging one another in the faith. Thank you, Father, for your great love and mercy that we experience in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.